to help you have a mental health year back My name is Michael Telstar, Canada's leading mentalist from Toronto, Ontario. Hi, my name is Sponza, and you're listening to my dad, Ron McConnell, on the XM. This is Psychic Dorothy from St. Catharines, and you're listening to Rob McConnell. Hello, my name is Holly Reeves, an astrologer from astro for You, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X-Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X-Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. <laughs> Welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll free 800 610 7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. <laughs> And our website where you can listen to the X Zone 724 com. My guest this hour is Michael Telstar. And uh, Michael attended the renowned Monroe Institute in Farber, Virginia, and uh, has taken the Gateway Guidelines H Plus and Trainers program. He is also a former escape artist with several world records. Michael has also taken the coordinate remote viewing program and his master's in extended remote viewing with Dr. David Morehouse. Michael is an accomplished painter and paranormalist whose artwork reflects other worlds, dimensions, and energy systems. He has traveled extensively in North America demonstrating his remote viewing abilities and conducting over a thousand seminars on remote viewing and out of body, uh, the out of body experience state. This presentation's uh, will be about OBE and RVs, and you'll be able to meet Michael June 26, 27, 28 in Brantford, Ontario, as he's one of the speakers at the Alien Cosmic Expo. For more information, visit www.aliencosmicexpo.com. Michael, welcome back to the Exxon. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm here. I am here, but I'm speaking to you out of body. <laughs> Knowing you, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel um, bilocated tonight for some reason. I'm not sure, but I, I don't, I'm still grounded, Rob, and it's terrific to talk to you again. It's always great to be on your show. You're a good man, Mike. I, I enjoy talking you. to you, and I enjoy our friendship. So what have you been up to lately, Mike? You, you always surprise well, me. I'm working on a uh, reality TV show called Above and Beyond. And other than that, I really can't say too much without revealing um, the special premise behind it. But I hope to get the network involved, and it's going to be a fantastic show about places, uh, you know, where a lot of, um, let me put it this way, a lot of people in history have been around, um, some known and some not known, and where, uh, where I'm going to attempt with another person to establish contact. Wow, super, Mike. Uh, listen, Mike, uh, tell me about your experience with remote viewing. Where did your interest come from, and what have you done with it? Well, the remote viewing, um, as you know, uh, Rob, and a lot of your listeners, is, is a modern term for clairvoyance, mm -hmm. and everyone has it. You have it, and it's inherent. And I, I developed it uh, naturally as a kid. We all have that ability where we visualize and our imaginations take over. It works the same principle almost. And I'm using, I've been utilizing the remote viewing uh, unconsciously as, uh, you know, and, and, and finding information, uh, finding lost object, and getting insight. Um, there's so much in how you could apply it. And I'm, I've been employing it, and I've actually extended it to remote telepathy, remote touching, uh, remote um, uh, reverse remote viewing, by the way, is a, a, a protocol that I developed and invented myself, just to let you know. And you haven't heard of that, I'm sure. How does it work? Well, reverse remote viewing, Rob, is where uh, this is where instead of uh, utilizing right um, a target, mm -hmm. you become the target. The remote viewer becomes the target and does it backwards, right? So how it works, uh, I can't exactly explain how it works, but basically 
Um, I got this idea from Ingo Swan. When he was told to remote view extraterrestrials or a spaceship mm -hmm. given to him by the CIA, he refused. Uh, do you know why he refused, Rob? No, why? <laughs> because he said that if I remote view them, they're going to know I'm there, and then they're going to start remote viewing me. So he was terrified of that. So I thought, well, okay, fine, I understand. And he and he, he refused to do the target. And um, he didn't want Vern to pick up in his energy signature. But I myself have inadvertently done that, where mm -hmm. I've become the subject in reverse, and so I call it reverse remote viewing, and there is a protocol that I developed where if you want to establish a connection with a higher life form, uh, you know, a EBE, ET, whatever you want to call them, yes. then you become the target for them. And then they're more liable to come to you as a result. But you've got to be ready to do it, though. You sure. can't be frightened. So, so tell me, when you do remote viewing, Michael, can you go into the future? Can you go into the past? Yes, yes. It's it's a simple matter of intent, Rob. You just focus. Uh, you just you think of a particular uh, week or month. It's not. You can't do it exactly by day or minute or hour because if you could, as you know, I wouldn't be sitting here, right? I'd have sure. all seven numbers for the super packs, right? Oh my God! That... Believe me, I have tried, right? So getting to the exact moment mm -hmm. and hour would be a rarity, and it could probably it's probably possible, I'm sure. But you can go back to a year and perhaps to a certain month. If you can go within a week, that would be very good. But it is possible to do that in what we call the past and what we term the future. But there are four or five different future variables connected with you, and then there are certain only one or two variables connected with the entire world. That's it? you understand it? what I'm saying? Uh, that's yeah, it, only like two? You have four or five possible futures, and you can command those to connect with those but not necessarily other people's futures. So how do we actually do that? How do we actually command our futures? Okay, well, what you do is you, you would remote view and you would connect either through the out-of-body state, mm -hmm. right? And what you would do is either go back to speak to a younger version of yourself or go forward, what you would say, say, two years from now, one year from now, and connect with that future version of yourself, telling them to come back to give you some information that you require. Wow. <laughs> Sounds kind of complicated, but it's not. How did you discover this, Mike? Oh, well, by accident. I, I, I found out by accident. Um, I had some uh, OBEs, and as you know, I do the lucid dreaming with the remote viewing, and I kind of combined them in a way. And I found out by accident that when I went back and spoke to a future, a past version of myself, somehow I warned it about something, and somehow. I noticed that my tomorrows were not the same. They were different, as if the impact, the ripple effect, had come up to me and caught up, whatever it might be, and it, it affected my my future. Not other people's future, but my own. So same thing with the future. Remote view your future self. Presumably, you know, and hopefully you're going to be alive, right, from mm -hmm. a year to five years from now. You don't want to go too far ahead. Imagine what you could know, uh, Rob, if you could just project, say, six months into the future and speak to yourself what wow. it could tell you about those six months, right? Yeah, I, I, I try to... like a long time. I, I would try to get a copy of the local newspaper, bring it with me, and give myself the That's winning right. numbers, yeah. That's right. Well, you know what? That's possible, because I have done that, but not the physical paper, but I have tried that. It, it's not easy. It takes a lot of thought and intent and, it, yeah. and, and energy, but it is very possible, and I'm sure people have done it on some unconscious level, you know? Yeah, uh, it, let, let me let me ask you, Mike, when 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 you go into the future, is there a chance that you may actually upset the time space continuum? No, I don't think so, because if it, if, if, if one thing is, you know, to the degree that we're thinking of, it wouldn't be upset. You're you're affecting your future, not someone else's future. You're working directly with your own. But so if it will affect your your future. But if but I have the time space continuum of the entire world or the earth or whatever. But what about the ripple effect? You know, if well, I well, change... the ripple effect will affect you. It will affect you. The butterfly effect or the effect of the past or future yeah. will have a direct impact on your persona and on your future. But why doesn't right? it but affect not necessarily... But why wouldn't it affect those that I have direct contact with? For example, my wife, my children, uh, the, the guy down the street. 
it makes no sense to me that I can change my future without changing the future of those around. Well, somehow there's a, there's an offshoot of that where it may have a variable impact. Like, for example, mm-hmm. it, would not, it would, would be very difficult for you to, to go back in the past and tell yourself not to get angry at this person so you don't harm them or kill them. Now, if you were to do that, right, it probably, it, it, you probably would not have the power or the impact to affect that, that energy state at that time. So therefore, even if, you, if you, even if you didn't become angry or whatever, something would probably still happen to that person, right? But the thing is that the, the, the energy variation, or the way it works, is very, it's very tricky. And I don't, I don't profess to know all the answers, eh, Rob? But I do know that mm-hmm. you can affect your future, and the very ones that are closest to you somehow will be affected to some degree, no doubt, somehow. But I don't know exactly what. For example, my mom... When she passed on four years ago, I had a dream, Rob, where I saw her clearly going about six months before, hmm. right? Yeah. And I tried to prevent that from happening, the dream of her leaving this physical world, because I, I thought it was going to happen in some other way, and it didn't. It happened while we were just sitting there and uh, with my present girlfriend, um, and we were, I was at a show downtown, and she had an aneurysm, and I, and I thought she was going to be struck by a car. So I made sure she had someone walk her home and do all that for six months. I actually moved in with her, and I tried to avoid that from happening. So I even knew it in the future. I had remote viewed it and seen it, and and I told a couple of people about it, but I couldn't avoid that. I avoided her getting hit because I saw something about her getting hit by right. a vehicle, but she still let you see. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Yeah, I do. I've got a question for you from one of our listeners. They sure. just uh, sent me okay, a question via Skype, and uh, anyone else who'd like to send a question... My Skype address is Exxon Radio TV, or you can send an email to onair at exxonradiotv.com. They come right to my desk here in our studio. The question is, do you, Michael, believe like Jim Mars that you can use remote viewing to contact aliens? Absolutely. That's what I was mentioning earlier. That's an absolute thing, but they, what, what, is an, what, what constitutes an alien to a person? You know, that's why I said an extra biological mm-hmm. entity, and you have to really focus on a particular being because, you know, they may not see themselves as aliens. You know, they may not understand even that term, right? Right. So I would just say to use your uh, ability, and I do have a 10 step uh, method, methodology, and what I do is I put my energy out there to contact any life form that has, uh, that is spiritually more aware and superior, to, you know, to my intellect and my awareness and my spirituality, and I wouldn't mind connecting with some, you know, uh, intelligence that exists outside of man. That's what I would say. So as an alien, you might, get, you might get the negative ones. You might get a reptiloid, a reptilian. You might get the small grays. You might get a nasty. So that's the thing. You have to be careful and know exactly what you're requesting. You All know? right. Michael, when did when did your interest in UFOs start? Because you know you've done the Monroe Institute, you're, you're a you're a well known escape artist. You've you've broken many records. So, from Monroe Institute to remote viewing to out of body ex- experiences to aliens, how did that all happen? Well, when I was in Fort Murray, Rob, I moved up there. My father took us up there, me and my two sisters, mm-hmm. um, when I was uh, 10 years old in Fort Murray, Alberta. And it's a pretty beautiful country up there. Have you ever been up there? No, I haven't. It's very nice. You know, it was population was just like 10,000 at the time. Wow. And um, it's a small city. We were on our way to Northwest Territories, but we didn't make it. So we went to Fort Murray, and they had a lot of incredible, I saw a lot of incredible things that happened. Um, and so did other people. And I thought it was highly unusual and everybody would acknowledge this type of thing. But I was told not to mention it and not talk about it. Uh, a bunch of us were, uh, when I joined the Arby Cadets, a bunch of us, about a hundred of us seen some object probably 500 yards away, uh, come out of nowhere above these trees and it descended over there. And I was on my way. Before we seen, I was like, I was on my way like a flash, and and the cab counselor quickly rushed up over there and grabbed me. Right, the other kids stood there, but I wanted to go over there and see it. Mm-hmm. And he said, 
don't go there. It's something you shouldn't be near. Right? So he was afraid. He didn't check it out. Police didn't know what it was. They also didn't check it out. So I've seen a lot of these actual physical craft because all the other fellows had seen it. And I dreamt of seeing, after this, by the way, Rob, I had constant dreams about objects coming overhead and landing, and I'd rush towards them, right? Wow. But I never reached them before they left. <laughs> my goodness. So that's where my interest peaked there, and I started reading about different things. But I, but I wasn't told what it was, and nobody wanted to talk about it. Are you finding... Yeah, pretty frightened. Are, are you finding in today's society more people are opening up and wanting to talk about it, Mike? Yeah, th- thank goodness. That's tr- that. That's hopefully that's true. I feel that's happening finally in Canada with this uh, with the a- Alien uh, Cosmic Expo happening and things. Mm-hmm. And it's just so. It's I think it's a great thing that people are just open because it's impossible. We know, right? That it's statistically impossible for there not to be other life forms out there. And so, a mathematician or an astronomer who doesn't think so. I'm just wondering what their true agenda is, or perhaps they're afraid, or they just don't want to admit to it. What is you, what, what do you think the agenda is, Mike? Do you think they're here to harm us, or do you think they're just here to observe no. what we're doing? Well, it's all those, right? It's here, it's some are here to, to uh, they made a deal, right, as you know, in 1947, with the government. Well, um, I, I, I really don't know that for a fact, but I'm told they did. Well, I think I think they probably did. I think there's some validity to that. To that, um, and apparently there are some here that are have permission to, ex, you know, to to take human beings. And then there are a large group, from what I understand, from my own personal knowledge, mm-hmm. Rob, there are uh, anywhere between sixty-five and seventy-five different species or different be- uh, different races here on planet Earth any one time. And this, a lot of them are here to offset that balance. So I think that if they weren't there, Rob, that we would have been taken or we would have been whatever a long time ago. So That's my personal feeling. So how come, how come not everybody sees these different alien species that are here? You said, what, 65 to 75 different species? 65 to 75 percent, wow. yeah. 65, I'm sorry, 65 to 75 types of races that are here working together. And those are the benevolent beings, not the negative ones. Negative ones, I have, I don't know how many would be here. You know, it would be hard to, to, to say. Right. Mike, why do you believe so, so deeply that the alien presence is real? Because I've had, I've actually had encounters, Rob. I've actually had physical and non-physical encounters. Wow. Something, as you know, that I've never mentioned before, um, I'm, speaking more about it now and i kept it quiet for years because i wasn't sure how i would be perceived and now it's come to a point now where i might as well share it i've been to the conferences in uh in uh the united states i've been to 25 uh, ufo conferences i never mentioned it at all and i just wanted to observe and see things and i've had visitations with witness without a witness physical and non-physical and then i've had physical confirmation of it happening when I thought I was going kind of a little bananas, let me put it that way. <laughs> can, can you share that experience with us? Sure. I had I had a OBE, and um, I had an experience, and I was conscious, and I knew about it, and I found myself suddenly uh, standing on a some type of balcony, um, and uh, it was uh, it was solid. Uh, I don't know, it was a, kind of a futuristic design or an unearthly design. And in front of me were three life forms. Mm-hmm. Each life form was a, was a female life form. Three of them, and they said, and they spoke to me, and they told me who they were, where they came from, and I asked them, why are you, why am I seeing the three of you here and no male? And they said to me, well, we didn't want have a male here because we know that you're more you're going to be insecure or feel threatened if there's a male here so we're here three females right three women and each of them was a, 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 a not an ambassador but somebody from that particular world that was contacting me and so i listened to what they said each asked me questions i listened that was the only question i asked by the way and they answered a lot of things before i could even ask and so i projected back in the physical woke up and at the time I didn't know what to make of it it wasn't a dream because it's solid 
uh, it was uh, 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 the OBE state, when you're having that experience, it wasn't a physical experience. When you're having the OBE state, it feels like it's a real experience because you're, you're vibrating on the same frequency of whatever entities or life forms are there. So it's easier for them to come and see you in that state. Anyway, I doubted, I doubted what had happened. I stayed up. I doubted it. Now, this is during the course of the night. Now, the next day, believe it, this is incredible. Believe it or not, I, I can prove it to some degree. But the next day, Rob, I have, you know, these, you remember these old-fashioned, you know, the old-fashioned telephone answering machines? Oh, yeah, sure. Ago? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so you know, you, you had two cassettes, right? Yeah. <laughs> one would hold messages, one would hold your voice network, right. you know, whatever. And on my and they told me now now in the in the in the in the, uh, in the experience that I had the obese state they told me what they who they were mm -hmm. and where they were from. Now on my machine, when I go out and do my business, come back that early evening, I'm playing my messages. And guess what? On the message on the tape is a female voice saying who she is, where she's from, and and there was a short message there pertaining to what happened in the OB state. Wow. And that and I you know what, I really loved that when I got that because that actually indicated to me that something solid was happening. Of course, I never tell anybody I write things down, but I never tell anybody, um uh this was just the next day too anyone in my experience, I keep it to myself. So when I had this confirmation that they they mentioned it was four sentences, they mentioned who they were, that there was a voice, and it was a very controlled female voice, okay? Now, it was very um, neutral, like, you know, it was very, um, not, not robotic, it was a female voice, but it was very unemotional, just direct message, you know? Mm. There was no emotion behind the voice, let me put it that way. What did you do with so that message? What did you do with that message, Mike? Do you still have it? I well, I had the message, and I had the tapes that was on, and you, you don't think you're going to lose this kind of stuff, and I haven't lost it. But unfortunately, my storage was broken into a little oh, over no. a year and a half ago, and I lost about forty years of my life. All my handcuff collection, my tank. Uh, my rare UFO books and special materials, audio, video, my portfolios, my manuscripts, everything about my mom and all that stuff. And, and it was an inside job, but unfortunately the, the police, they, they investigated it, but they did a very mild investigation. Now, be, before and we I go on, Mike. I suspected. Pardon? I was just going to say, Mike, before we go on, I think we should okay. clarify with our audience, why you have a handcuff collection. It's not that you're kinky. I mean, you're kinky in one way. But, you know, the, the handcuff collection was used... Well, I just got a giggle from my girlfriend here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, she, no problem. She she's a, she... <laughs> would, you like, would you like me to go on hold? I'll play some music, Mike, and you can sure. get your handcuffs out and have fun. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know what? I only I only got a couple <laughs> pairs left, eh? But I'm going to rebuild my collection again. You animal, you! But I was an, I was an escape artist, like you mentioned, right? Yes. Escape artist. So I had uh, my several of my straight jackets and other equipment, and a, a lot of things I can replace, but a lot of stuff, unfortunately, I can't replace. And I ha and I know where it is, Rob. I just can't get at it. Why? Why would somebody do well, that to you, Mike? Cooperate. Mike, you're one of the well, nicest guys. Good. Mike, you're one of the nicest guys I know. Why would anybody do that to you? Well, the manager at this place, and I, I guess I better not give the name. I was there for 17 years and um, had no problems. And then a new manager came on and uh, just a very troubling individual. Really, and, I, yeah. you know, I'd made some complaints about the person. And, you know, apparently, um, you know, I wasn't the only one. Let me put it, I wasn't the only one whose locker was uh, broken into and things just vanished. Oh, that sucks. You know? And it can't be sold. It's not ordinary things. Right. If I didn't have furniture. It was all... Well, extraordinary things, and and I have an idea where it is. I reviewed it, but the police will not cooperate. And I was told by a lawyer just to go there and get it, walk out, and you know, help me with the repercussions. But I was threatened by the police. Whoa! Told them, told them that I go on these grounds, that they'll arrest me and charge me, and break and enter my own things. Unbelievable, Mikey. 
It is. It is unbelievable because on my hard drive and one of the computers was a lot of physical things that I had, photographs, things, plus my tape that I mentioned to you and a lot of other things. But well, I learned to let that go, but I will get the things back, some of it back. I'm just wondering how I'm going to do it. Well, knowing you, my friend, you will get it back because I've never known you to not be able to face a challenge and overcome any obstacle. Yes, and my, my, my mother would have been sad by what happened, but she would say to me to, to go forward too, you know, to try to, you know, but I've got to, I've got to be careful what I do, and I'm sure. just trying to figure out, I'm trying to work inside the law, and that's the problem, you know. Tell me about uh, Dr. Russell Targ. Oh, Russell Targ is a fascinating guy. Uh, uh, Russell Targ was one of the laser um, physicists at the Stanford Research Institute, mm-hmm. and uh, along with Harold Perthoff, and those guys were two very brave men who took it on themselves to help develop the protocol for the uh, remote viewing with Ingo Swan right. and the military. Um, and uh, 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 they were remarkable men, and he was a good friend, too, by the way, of Pat Price, who was known as the king of remote viewers. I'm not sure if you've heard of him, you probably have. He's a pretty remarkable man, and um, he had been he had worked previously with the CIA before he had become a uh, laser physicist, or he was already one at the time. And um, he had been a good friend of Pat Price's. And when Pat Price uh, went to Vegas, he'd go to Vegas often because he used remote viewing abilities to win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so on one of his junkets, he went there, and uh, Russell Todd tried to get a hold of him, and he couldn't. So he went up there personally. And they said he had had a heart attack, so he, he went to the morgue, and they said, well, some guys in black came and took him away. So I am suspect that he hadn't died. Pat Price hadn't died. He was a, a, a remote viewer with, uh, uh, like, 100 remote viewers rolled into one. And so Russell Clark did an investigation, and unfortunately, he never did find out what happened to him, but we suspect that he's still alive. Mike, you and I have to take a commercial break. Uh, we'll be back shortly. But before we go, Mike... Isn't there some way that you could use remote viewing, going into the past, getting the information that you require, and bring the evidence to the police? That's right. That's exactly what I did. But the police will not, they will not, uh, they listen to me some, but they will not cooperate or help. And can you believe that I had actually two weapons in that storage, too, by the way? I had two 357 Magnums. I owned three of them, and I had one here uh, uh, somewhere. And the other two were in my storage locker. Mm -hmm. And they were used in my uh, Russian roulette routines, and they were real. And I told this to police because I thought for sure they would go and get the effects so they can get those back. Sure. And he says, don't worry, you told us about this now. Somebody uses the guns now, and now you're not responsible. And that was about the only extent of the investigation they did other than interview the manager. Michael, stand by. We're going to be back in a couple of minutes. Exonation. Michael Telstar is our very right. special guest. www.michaeltelstar.com and Telstar is with two R's.com. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon. I'll be back on the other side as we continue our investigation into the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology as we continue this quest, this crusade, this investigation right here around the world on the Starcom Radio Network. Don't go away. to be able to read other people's minds well the next best thing is here when you know how to read a person's name you know how the person thinks feels and behaves each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime Mnemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names including the first and last impression people remember about us Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Mnemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. 
You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. In the world today, most people want what is called the American dream. They want love, a family, a fancy car, and a nice home in a nice neighborhood. They also want a good job and money to travel to interesting places. Life is great because they have the American dream. But what happens to this dream if they hear they have a devastating illness like lung cancer? The doctor may tell them they need treatment immediately or they will be dead in six months. He tells them, you need surgery, and then you need chemotherapy to get better. When they get home, they think of many unanswered questions. They ask themselves, will I survive when so many of my friends with cancer have died? How will I deal with the pain, hair loss, nausea, and vomiting, sore mouth, and other side effects of chemotherapy and pain of surgery? Will I be able to keep on working? What will happen to my family? Then they look at the internet and wonder, is there a better way to deal with lung cancer and return to my American dream? Carl Helvey can tell you, yes, there is a better way. Carl Helvey is a registered nurse with a doctorate in public health and a 38-year lung cancer survivor. Carl was given six months to live when diagnosed, and he refused chemotherapy and surgery. Carl used alternative interventions. Those not only helped him overcome lung cancer, but also to remain cancer-free and healthy for over the past 36 years since recovery. In his book, You Can Beat Cancer Using Alternative Integrative Interventions, Dr. Helvey will tell you his story of using all natural treatments for lung cancer and continuing to work during his treatment. Free of pain and discomfort, Carl will also share how he remained cancer and disease-free since then without chronic illnesses or prescribed medications. His story is supplemented with chapters by Dr. Bernie Siegel, Dr. Francesco Contreras, and Dr. James Forsyth, alternative integrative physicians, and Dr. Kim Dalzell and Tanya Harder-Pierce, health professionals. All have successfully helped others overcome cancer. Research presented by the alternative physicians on their treatments for lung cancer demonstrate a significantly higher long-term survival rate for lung cancer clients than those obtained by conventional doctors. In addition, their clients were free of or had reduced side effects. You can beat lung cancer using alternative integrative interventions by Dr. Carl Helvey is now available at all major book outlets and at www.beatlungcancer.net. That's www.beatlungcancer.net. This information may help you return to the American dream. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi, this is Eric Rawls of Cosmoverse.com, and you're listening to Rob McConnell in the X-Zone. Hi, this is Blade Runner, and you are listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X-Zone, with Rob McConnell. Hi, I'm Laura Sabrin of Ceased to Fields Organic Vineyard in Jordan, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal radio show, The X-Zone. 
Tropicana. Hi, my name is Lady Ashley, the White Witch of Niagara on the Lake, and you're listening to Canada's number one paranormal talk radio show, The X Zone, with Rob McConnell. Welcome to The X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. How? Welcome back, everyone. Michael Telstar is our guest of this hour, www.michaeltelstar.com. Mikey, welcome back. Uh, we enjoyed listening to your conversation. So thanks, Mike. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, can I get a small analogy about when you mentioned about um, how would you use your remote viewing ability or out-of-body estate to sure. con- connect with extraterrestrials? Yeah. Uh, say, for example, all right, say you had, like, we're going to use a celebrity, Okay, a celebrity, it could be anyone, all right, uh, political or a celebrity show business person, where you, you send them an email. Yeah. Now, you have their email address, but because you have it and you do send it to them, does that mean you're automatically going to get a response? No. Of course not. That's exactly it. So you have connected with them, you have sent them a message, but they're too busy to connect back with you. So you understand what I mean now, just because you may have had an OBE and this happened to me many years, Mm -hmm. you know, where I did want to contact and it was established communication, but nothing was happening. And so I was wondering, so uh, persistence pays off, but you also have to have a deep desire to want to contact that, that, uh, extraterrestrial person could be from the Nephilim. It could be an indigenous species that's a homo superior from earth or a species that's off planet. And, it, and once you do it, and you say, for example, if you send a thousand emails to this star, they're bound to get a reply saying, okay, I'm going to acknowledge that you contact me. Here's what you want to know or whatever. Or maybe, you know, I'm going to do this because you've been sending it so many times, and this way you don't have to bother me anymore, right? <laughs> hmm. So it's something similar to that. So if you, if you know the species and the race, or if you just send it out generally, and your brain wave starts emanating a peculiar frequency, as you might know, alpha and theta at the same time. So you're like a lighthouse beacon, you know, sending out the signal. And sooner or later, some entity, a higher life form, will see that you're in this altered state of consciousness, and they will come and pay you a visit. But you've got to be prepared you, emotionally. You've got to be ready. And they want to make sure that you're ready. So I had this desire for years. I've had, I only had the encounters later. When I when I, I I thought I was ready and I wasn't, but later on I did, and it just it happened naturally. And when I did, I, you become what happens is you become a, a recipient or you become a a volunteer or you're recruited in some way. But I don't really want to get into that right now. Um, Bob, yeah, yeah. How, how do you prepare yourself for these? these out-of-body experiences that you have? Do you meditate? Do, do you just lower your vibrational frequency down? Do you meet a frequency? How do you do it, Mike? Well, the way I do it, the way I have learned it, all right, as, in the way that it's the most natural is that I don't visualize. I mean, I don't see myself. Uh, I don't squeeze my essence out of my forehead. There are a lot of things that I read about and studied throughout the years, and the way the Monroe Institute talks about it is different as well. But my technique is simple where I'm in bed and I get into this peculiar state. And it's a, it's a special state of mind, a hypnagogic, or uh, you can call it what you want, a hypnagogic hypopompic sleep paralysis. But you're in this state where you're in this peculiar state of vibration. And there is a rush of energy. Um, and what happens is I start to roll my eyes. If I roll my eyes in my head 260 degrees, that means it's a good sign that I'm not I'm not in my physical. Because if you if you close your eyes, you can go back and forth, but you can't actually roll them. Once mm-hmm. my eyes start rolling, then I start spinning my body in the bed, spinning it like a top. Now, if you try spinning in bed in the physical, what's going to happen? <laughs> it all, it all depends what time it is, where I am, and who's in well, bed with me. That's right. You're going to roll up on the floor, right? You're yeah. going to roll right on the floor. And you're gonna just hit the ground. But if you, but but once I start rolling my eyes and I start mm-hmm. rolling my body like a top, 
like a like a log, like a log, then I know that I'm in a non-physical web from the eyes. And then what I do is I keep spinning my eyes faster, and then I keep spinning, spinning, and then I just physically, it's like I'm physically whooshing out of the bed. It sounds right? it sounds and, like and you're having cases, it sounds like you're having a seizure. Well, that yeah, you could say that I guess. And who and my brain waves mm-hmm. they recorded them at the master of check, check unit in Monroe, and they are very powerful theta, but would also combine with strong alpha brain waves, which means that I am aware of what's happening. I'm focused. Wow. So I get out of bed. You would get out of bed just like you do in the physical almost, and you'd fool yourself into thinking you're waking up in the physical. Same thing, by the way, for um, uh, lucid dreaming. But the OBE state, I basically get out, and I roll out, and I and then I, I've done, you know, I've turned around, see myself in bed. Okay, I've only done it a couple of times, and because this was after years when I can resist the tug. And what I did once was I saw myself laying in bed. I don't, you don't look like yourself, by the way. Your perceptions of, of seeing is different when you're in the second state, Rob. So when I looked down at myself, I didn't recognize myself, but I knew it was me. Then I took my non-physical fingers, and I wanted to see if I could touch my physical body. And when I, when I brushed my cheek with my non-physical fingers on my physical cheek, I felt my non-physical cheek being brushed at the same time. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So, so, so I've, got, I've got a question here from uh, Sally, who lives in Anchorage, Alaska. She uh, said, hey, Rob, really love the Exxon. Glad you're on Starcom. We listen to Ed Till every day. What a, what a hoot the guy is. Here's a question from Michael. When it comes to remote viewing, okay, the yeah. the method you described, can you do it in a bedroom, dining room, or even a toilet seat? Absolutely. I mean, it's the same thing for uh, OBE. My, my, my desire is to be able to project into the second state if I'm in a theater with all that noise and crowd, and then that's mm-hmm. when you really master it. But of course you can do it. People have a uh, remote view and have uh, these experiences in the midst of having sex or when they have euphoria or fear. Well, wait a sec. So hold on. Hold can... on here. Hold on here. You can have an out-of-body <laughs> experience when you're having sex? Absolutely. There's many cases of that occurring. Um, there are many uh, cases of women during my remote viewing uh, classes and seminars and pra- uh, po- uh, the programs that I've done, Rob, uh-huh. and this is true. Not just me, but other other uh, uh, leading um, uh, uh, seminar facilities where women do express having some type of orgasm when they're having a remote viewing session. Have you? I'm had... not making that up. I let, know it sounds let, incredible, let but I gotta ask... say it. I've never said it before, but I gotta say it because I, it's true. And you know what? You can contact David Morehouse. And uh, uh, Inkle Swan or, mm-hmm. or uh, Paul Elder, who, who teaches at uh, uh, Victoria, you know, in, in Vancouver. Yeah. They're friends of mine, Paul Elder. And they'll tell you that women are very susceptible to the energy because it's a very fine energy. And it affects some incredible center of the brain, Is euphoria. It, yeah. And, you know? Sure. And it, it affects it. And, and men will have it, too, but a different way. They will interpret the sensation as different. Wow. Like so so, that, so that's why some women call out the wrong guy's name while they're having sex, because they're having a remote, remote <laughs> experience. Yeah. That, that's possible. Yeah. Uh, that's, I wouldn't put it behind it, yeah. So, so <laughs> listen, listen uh, just between you and me and about 40 million people right now, Mike, um, do you have out-of-body experiences when you're with your girlfriend? Um, yes, I, you know, you, you know, the, 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 the out of body, I have an out of body experience every night. Really? You do too. Everybody does. They just don't remember. I got to stress that out. I got to make that stress. And what I do is teach people how to become conscious either while having it or after they've had it to initiate a trigger to become conscious. But you can have a lot of experiences when you have this whoosh energy. But That's okay. Now little, when you're having these, so, so do we also need to squeeze really hard when we're having, uh, to get into these experiences? Not necessarily. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I think that there are a lot of ways of having an OBE. Okay. Right? And the best way is the natural way, but there is the chemical way. Uh, I mentioned this in my OBE manuals. Be, to be careful because, you know, uh, people have, what that happens is that they have an unresponsive or they have an unconscious OBE as a result of taking uh, mushrooms 
or smoking, uh, uh, you know, uh, cannabis or LSD or whatever. And what happens is that when you have an uncontrolled OBE, mm-hmm. well, that's exactly what it is. It's like drinking 100 beers and trying to walk. <laughs> Only a hundred. You know, so what kind of Canadian well, are you if you have problems drinking and walking after a hundred <laughs> beer, Mike? Well, I don't know, oh. but I'm not Andre the Giant. He used to have repeatedly a hundred beers at a sitting. But really, the thing is that, yeah. And the thing is, when I did learn to do it, I felt like I was drunk and drugged, but I didn't take any drugs. It was natural, and that's also because mm-hmm. your uh, your mind is becoming acclimated to that state. So when you project every night, Rob, and all the listeners here. I assure you that you all project every night just like you dream. Mm-hmm. Um, you're you're a master at it already because you're doing it on a super conscious level. It's unconscious. But when you start to become conscious, you see, it's like learning to walk again, to see again. What's the difference between an out-of-body experience, Mike, and a dream? Okay, well, an OBE, an OBE state... All right, when you have an OBE state, uh, you're the reality, you're in the reality you're in. You're in locale one or locale two. Locale one is the physical universe. Locale two is a non-physical. We won't get into that. But a dream shifts. It shifts every second. It makes no sense. You're having, you're having Chinese food um, on the hood of somebody's car while it's flying in the air or it's raining or something. Now, it continues these, but an OBE, you will, you will wake up. You will mm-hmm. shift in your room, and your room will be exactly the same. It will be the same. The bed will be there. The clamp will be there. It'll be whether it's night or day. That that's the type of conditions it will be. But if you have a lucid dream or a, a, a dream, it'll shift. Lucid dream is different, though, too, a little bit different. And of course, remote viewing. Well, remote viewing, your senses are there, but you mm-hmm. don't there feel like you're there physically. But when you have an OBE, though, Rob, you feel like you're actually there, you know, in the Grand Canyon or visiting your girlfriend, or whatever. You, 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 you sense that you're, you are there. Your energy presence or energy body is there. But remote viewing, it's like seeing it on a screen yeah. that's 360 degrees, and you, don't, you can't see your hands. There is no hands, just awareness. Hmm. That's, that's very interesting. Mike, we've got yeah. to, we're, we've got, we're coming down to the final minutes of, of tonight's show. Mike, what are you going to be talking about at the Alien Cosmic Expo that's going to be in Brantford, Ontario, June 26, 27, and 28? Well, I'll, I'll be doing a, uh, actually two uh, lectures on uh, Saturday morning at 9 and on Sunday at, at uh, 3 p.m. And I'll be uh, going through uh, some uh, out-of-body experiences and techniques at 9 a.m. on uh, Saturday morning, and how to utilize that ability to contact higher life forms. Well, you know, whether that's an ET or right. EBE, that's fine. Um, and then on Sunday, I'll be talking about remote viewing techniques and how to uh, pick up other intelligences. And of course, there are very there are different models that I've learned on remote viewing that can be very beneficial to law enforcement, medical protocol, personal protocol. And there's even a Las Vegas one that you might like. <laughs> really? T- qu- quickly, Absolutely. tell me about... Monroe Institute started teaching uh, Las Vegas protocol, and that's based on Pat Price's remote viewing ability. They started doing it about eight years ago. <laughs> hmm. Hey, yeah. y- you, you know a lot of people in the trade. Whatever happened to Chris Angel? Well, Chris Angel, um, show was on about three, three and a half years. And what, what was the situation is that Chris Angel started as a special effects uh, wizard, you know, right. a special effects guy for movies. Yeah. And then he got into the magic, you know. And what happened was that he was doing some stuff on the TV. It was fine. But then after a while, he was incorporating um, uh, t- uh, too many stooges and incorporating too many people. For example, when he was swimming or when he was walking in the water, everybody in the pool was a paid background person. Oh. When he went and walked in the street, everybody on the street was a paid background person. Can you understand what I'm saying? Oh, sure can. So it was like a film. And so it was like doing a film. It was not, uh, uh, you're allowed, you know, as a performer, if you want to have two or three people, that's okay. If you want to have, uh, you know, a group of people that will participate in one act, like when David Copperfield had to have 200 people circle the Statue of Liberty, mm-hmm. I'm sure that they didn't get them off the street, right? They'd have to pay them. But those people were not in on it, right? They, they didn't know how he did it, but they were there because he needed them. So, but the thing is about Prince Angel is that he would, he would start using people that he would, you know, it, was, it should have been called a special effects wizardry for 20 minutes or 30 minutes by Chris Angel because he was making 
uh, um, kind of turning it into a mockery where he was having everybody on set that would be an accomplice. Wow. Understand? Yeah. So it wasn't reality TV. So he was doing that. So a lot of magicians, a lot of magicians complained about that, and a lot of other people did too. And something happened, and they and they he started using computer animation effects. So, so you have you seen the movie Ghost with Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze? Oh sure, yeah, one of my favorite films. Oh, that's a great film. I, I just got it the other day, by the way. My my girlfriend's never seen it. She's gonna like it. Uh, you're you're t- you're, t- you're, you're, you're you're talking about the movie now, right? Yeah, I'm talking about. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm not right. talking about my little sunshine here. I'm <laughs> talking about the movie. Do you, do you remember the parts where he he runs through the walls? Yes, he's going through walls. Yeah. And stuff. Well. Chris Angel did that effect, but he was using computer animation green screening now. So it wasn't a real physical thing. Uh, so it should not have been sold as that, but it was, you see, and that's what happened. Can you understand? I, I sure do now. Here's another question for you, and I'm watching that's my clock. That's why he's not on the air now. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I'm watching my clock. I've got less than... I like than... David Blaine. I like David Blaine a lot. What about Penn and Teller? David? What about Penn and Teller? Penn and, Penn and Teller, well, you know what... Uh, I've seen them only once about 20 years ago, but Penn and Teller are okay, but I really don't like them revealing some of the effects. And uh, I don't know, they're, they're, they've got their own style of performing. Mm-hmm. They remind me that, you know, they're, they're a magic comedy duo of Abba and Costello. That's what they remind me of. I love them, yeah. You know, but, but yeah, but the thing is that I really, really, really uh, like his style of showmanship, but I wish they wouldn't reveal some of the stuff which they have. You know, you know that some of the stuff that they've, They've had yeah. some TV stuff, right, where they've revealed it. And I don't think they should because they're at the top, right? And there are people, there are performers using some of those techniques, still, Right? But I do like them a lot, though. What are you, are, are you going to be doing any of your great escape work uh, again, Mike? Are you going to go out and try and break some more records? Well, I'm, you know, I'm in the process now. I'm, I'm doing some uh, workout, workout program now, and I'm in the process of getting back into as good a strip as possible. Right. I may like to do something, you know, um, where that incorporates some sort of mind over matter of escape. Mm-hmm. And I just have to work on that now and get myself in psychological and physical shape um, and see what I could do, you know. And it would be a real escape. It wouldn't be an illusion. It would be a real, genuine escape where, you know, you either, you either do it or you don't. You're either, like making an escape, for example, from a prison. You can't, you can't fake that, right? If a guy wants to escape, he's got to either be out or not, right? <laughs> yeah, but there's also a major risk of trying to escape, getting shot while escaping, or That's just not making it at right. all. That's right. So the whole thing would be to escape mm-hmm. and, and not notice that you've escaped. You know, create the illusion that you're still there, just like those guys did in Alcatraz. Yeah. Right? Gotcha. But I would like to do an escape at the Don Jail. That's one thing that I'm maybe looking at, doing a genuine escape. But the problem is, is that they don't want me to do it because they're afraid that if I do it, that anyone else can do it. So what you're, know how I did it. So, so what you're telling me, Mike, is that if I'm watching CTV news or if I'm watching city news and I hear that Michael Telstar has been arrested and has been sentenced to three days in the Don Jail that... I should watch for you escaping. Is that what you're saying? That's 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 right. That's possible. Yes, something like that, similar to that. But I would want to work with the authorities instead mm-hmm. of against them, because yeah. I wouldn't want to get shot either myself. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a quick question from Sarah. She's listening to us in Toronto on Starcom Radio Network. Mike, have you ever thought of running for mayor of Toronto? Mayor of Toronto? Uh, yeah. Forget it. Mayor of Las Vegas? Absolutely. <laughs> Or mayor of another world, maybe. <laughs> hey, hey, Mike, our time is up for tonight. I want to thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Please give my best to your girlfriend. And uh, quickly, let our listeners know how they can find out more about you, buddy. Okay, well, just give me a call uh, at 647-705-8194. Or look at my website, michaeltelstar.com www.michaeltelstar.com, two R's and Telstar. Mm-hmm. And if anybody has a question or whatever, feel free to email me there. And I'm going to be doing, by the way, a triple blind remote viewing test on Sunday afternoon. Well, so I hope for folks to come up there. It's going to be a big uh, test of my uh, remote viewing ability. Mike, I look forward. Test. Mike, I look forward to seeing you again, my friend. Take care of yourself. Yeah. 
Yes, we'll connect with soon, soon, Rob. Thank you very much. And uh, if your listeners listening, I'll just want to see me. Come on straight up in the air, make a lift, and I'll be there waiting for you. All right, Mike. Take care, buddy. <laughs> bye bye now. You, Rob. Bye bye, friend. Exxon Nation, my guest this hour was Michael Telstar. What a character. Like I said, I've had the pleasure of, you know, interviewing Mike over the phone. I've interviewed him in person. He's just a real great guy. The records he holds are unbelievable. In fact, you know, he, he's done everything Houdini's done. So there you go. Well, that's it for tonight. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the Exxon. The Exxon is Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until 10, uh, 11 p.m. right here on the Starcom Radio Network. So from everyone here at the Exxon to everyone out there, remember, always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Please have an enjoyable, safe weekend. We'll see you back on Monday.